What is a miracle? What does it look like? Is it beating a Russian hockey team? Making it to work just in time after waking up late? Or maybe it looks more like feeding a crowd of over 5,000 with the equivalent of a kid's sack lunch. Or raising a man from the dead. Or how about paying the price for sin and defeating death forever through the sacrifice of the cross? Now that's a miracle. We serve a God who is able to perform miracles. And every time he does, he has a specific purpose in mind. So you may believe. The Apostle John speaks of seven such miracles, each emblematic of the character of Christ. Yet the age of miracles didn't end 2,000 years ago, no. He still heals the sick. He still guides our steps. And through the Holy Spirit, we too can have a piece of that miraculous resurrection power. The story was written, and yet, God continues to write it today through us. All right, good morning, everybody. And on uh, Spring Forward Sunday, ugh. <laughs> so, may God doubly bless you for putting him first this morning, all right? Let's get into God's Word together. Find the Gospel of John, chapter 2, would you? If you'd like to use the Bibles we provide, that's page 1059, and you'll be home. And while you're doing that, you know, I love weddings. One of the perks of being a, a pastor is I get to officiate weddings. Uh, I've lost count how many I've done. My guess is somewhere between 250 and 300, all right? So I know weddings. And, and I'll just say this, weddings are potential for great drama, right? <laughs> so, uh, of course, Hollywood's picked up on this. That's why there are a lot of uh, movies and TV shows about weddings, right, throughout all the years. My favorite, of course, is Say Yes to the Dress. Just an awesome show. No, I'm kidding. I've never seen that in the world. Why would I watch that? But my wife and daughter have watched that show. But, you know, there's, there's lots of drama associated uh, with weddings, potentially. Because, you know, let's just be honest. When you go to a wedding, you kind of have one eye towards all the goodness of the wedding, right? The how, you know, everyone looks and how happy everybody is and the, the holiness of the moment and the grace and the goodness of the moment and the love that's being shared and all that. Then you kind of have this other eye to, you look, you're sort of looking for those potentially viral moments, you know, like something that's really potentially good that could go viral or let's be honest, something potentially that could go bad that's also potentially viral. Well, 2,000 years ago, there was a wedding that took place in northern Israel, and there was a potentially viral moment. But Jesus stepped in and saved the day. And in doing so, he gave us the first of many, what the Bible calls, signs. All right? Let me show you. John chapter 2. So, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. All right? So these first two verses are the context of our story. You get the when and the who and the where of our story. So let's just dive into the context. First, it says, on the third day. So what's the third day? Well, the third day, if you re read back in the story, the third day, this is th the third day of Jesus' public ministry. I would call it. He, would just, he was baptized just a few days ago. He's beginning to call disciples to himself. He's beginning his public ministry. So on the third day of his public ministry, he's at this wedding in Cana of Galilee. So let me put this map up on the screen to show you where we're talking about. We're in northern Israel, and there you see kind of Jerusalem in the middle. And if you go up, there you see at the very top in Galilee, there's Cana. Now, I'd like for you to observe, please, that Nazareth is just about eight miles to the south of Cana. That's Jesus' hometown. All right? So now we're getting into the who of this wedding. It is very, very, very possible, I would say probable, that Jesus' family knew at least one of the families involved in this wedding. They maybe even grew up together. Who knows? But we're, we're near each other up there. All right? So now we're getting into the who. If you notice, there's the mother of Jesus. There's Mary who is there. Jesus is there, and his disciples were there. At this time, Jesus had called five men to follow him. So that's who is at the wedding. Now, 
Can I just make a quick sidebar comment? All right, over here. Jesus, I don't know what your theology is of Jesus, but maybe you need to tweak it just a little bit. Jesus was invited to a wedding, and he went. I don't know what your theology is, but if your theology is Jesus was so holy, he was a fuddy-duddy party killer, you need to change your theology. Jesus, even though he was holy, he was also fun. He was also a friend. He also meant something to these people. That's why they invite, who do you invite to your wedding? People who matter to you. He mattered to these people. Those people mattered to him, and he mattered to them. And he was invited to the wedding because he loved them, and he was fun. He's not a party killer. So if you are a fully devoted follower of Jesus, don't be a fuddy-duddy. Okay, now back to the sermon. All right. That's the context of our story. Now here comes the potentially viral moment. Here's the conflict. Verse 3. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. Okay, here's the conflict. The first problem is they ran out of wine. All right, now listen. You got to go back in this culture. I know weddings today are a big production, huge production potentially, but 2,000 years ago in this culture, wedding feasts, they're called feasts, the, the wedding reception, what we call it, it didn't just last for an afternoon or an evening, it lasted all week. It could go up to seven, these people knew how to party, seven days of a wedding reception, they called it a feast. So I'm assuming we're a few days in to this wedding feast and they run out of wine. Now, I know you wine drinkers are like, yeah, that is a tragedy, you know? <laughs> but more so than that, in this culture, uh, if you run out of wine at your wedding, that is a disgrace. This is a culture of honor and shame. Everything is judged by whether or not you bring honor to yourself and your family or you bring disgrace to yourself and your family. Running out of wine at the wedding of your children would have brought disgrace to these families' names for years to come. That's the reality of this culture. And so Mary, I think, obviously knowing these people, somehow being closely connected to these people, she's one of the first to realize they've run out of wine. And then she turns to her son and says, they've run out of wine. Now that's a statement, but you can kind of get it in, within that statement is a request for help. And so Jesus says back to her, interestingly enough, he calls her woman. He doesn't say mom, partly because I think it could have been translated mom, and he didn't want that, all right? But the other thing, he called her woman, which don't be offended by that. The term could mean like dear woman. It's a, it could be a term of affection, but it is interesting that he called her mom, he called her woman and not mom. And I think, I think here's the reason why. Because he's begun his public ministry now, and he has to educate his mom that while he will always be her son, he's also the son of God. And he's on a divine mission, and he's on a divine calendar, and he's come to do his father's business, and he's got to do his father's will, and to keep pace with his father. And so he said, uh, what is this to us? My hour has not yet come. And when Jesus talks about his hour, he's talking about his death, the hour of his death. And so what he's saying to his mom is, mom, listen, when I begin to do these public miracles, that will expedite the day of my death. Every miracle I do takes me one step closer to the cross. And the time for me to begin doing that has not yet come. And so here's the tension. A family that he cares about has run out of wine. His mom's made a, a hidden request to him to help out. But the time for him to begin public miracles has not yet come. So what does he do? Verse 5. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. By the way, that's good advice for life. Verse 6, now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, 
containing 20 to 30 gallons each. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. And so they took it to him. And when the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, every man serves the good wine first. And when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Okay, here's the solution. How cool. So first of all, notice Jesus doesn't make a huge public spectacle of this. There's only a handful of people who even knew what he did. The servants, the Bible is clear, were some of them. How cool is it that these servants obeyed Jesus, took the water, and by the time that the water got to the head waiter, it had become wine. Observation. These servants got to participate in the first miracle because they obeyed. Their obedience led to a miracle. But also, okay, so turning water into wine. This water, these, these big, on average, 25-gallon uh, vats of water. So there are six of them. If my math is right, that's 150 gallons. 150 gallons of water. Uh, these were used for purification rites, which when the guests would come to the wedding, they would wash their hands and sometimes their feet with it. So this is dirty water. 150 gallons of dirty water. Jesus said to fill it up, and in the process of taking the water to the head waiter, it became wine. 150 gallons of wine. Woohoo! Some of you wine drinkers aren't, you're trying to act all holy right now. <laughs> but Jesus took dirty water and turned it into good wine. Now, I love that about the story, just to be honest with you. When Jesus does a miracle, he does it good. <laughs> he didn't make no gas station wine, right? He made H-E-B wine. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he, he made the good stuff. All right. That was his solution to the problem. And he, in doing so, he both honored his mom and cared for his friends who had the potentially viral problem. All right? So... I know all of you consumers of wine love this story. It's your favorite miracle. But the truth is, there's a little more going on than just wine. All right? And here it is. Last verse, verse 11. This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Okay, so we're talking about signs. So what's a sign? Signs are an important part of life. You know, we have them all over the place. What does a sign do? Two things. One, it attracts you to it, but then it also directs you someplace else. It attracts you and directs you. All right. That's what a sign does. It attracts you to it. And then it usually has a message directing you to another place, another person, another event, whatever it may be. So here's the value of a sign that it directs you to something more important than itself. Signs attract and direct. That's what a sign does. So the Bible says that this miracle that Jesus performed at the wedding of Canaan in Galilee was his first sign designed by God to attract us and direct us. What are we supposed to be attracted and directed to? Would you look at the verse again? This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. Why? And manifested his glory. This is the beginning of Jesus attracting you and directing you to his glory. Not just the glory as the son of man, but the glory as the son of God. Now, how many of you like to read? Where are my readers at? Okay, man, more than I thought. Good for you. So have you ever read a novel and you've gotten to a point in the story where there's just so much mystery and so much tension, you just can't wait to know how it all ends, and so you cheat and read the end of the book. How many of you done that? Okay. If we were to do that with the Gospel of John, you'd get to the end of the Gospel in John chapter 20, verse 31, and here's what you would find. Here's the whole point of the book. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these signs have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, 
and that believing you may have life in his name. That's why these signs were written down. And did you notice it had its effect on the disciples? The disciples saw they were attracted and directed to the manifestation of Jesus' glory. And what does it say at the very end of verse 11? They believed in him. They believed. And that's the whole point of these signs, is so that you may believe in him and that he may transform your life. This is a miracle of transformation. Jesus took an ordinary vat of dirty water and turned it into some good wine. And beloved, he can do that with you. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. He can do this with you. What he did to the water, he can do with you. I, he I heard this illustrated in a fantastic way many years ago. My dad went to a, uh, a conference in California when he used to live there. It was a men's conference and the LA Forum, just thousands of guys gathering around and, and a black preacher comes up on stage and he says something like this. He says, man, I just want to tell you, the secret to life is that it all depends on whose hands it's in. You see, this baseball bat in my hands, oh, it's worth about $200. But this baseball bat in Mike Trout's hands is worth $400 million. You see, it all depends on whose hands it's in. And then he took a golf club and he said, man, this three iron in my hands, oh, it's a deadly weapon. <laughs> but this three iron in Tiger Woods' hands is worth a championship. You see, it all depends on whose hands it's in. And then he took a tennis racket and he said, this tennis racket in my hands, oh, I think I paid $15 for it. But this tennis racket in Serena Williams' hands is a Wimbledon championship. You see, it all depends on whose hands it's in. And so, men, I'm here to tell you the secret to life is that it all depends on whose hands it's in. Jesus can take an ordinary vat of water and turn it into some beautiful good wine, and he can do that with you. You might feel insignificant. You might feel ordinary. You might feel left out. You might feel unattractive. You might feel untalented, but you put yourself in the hands of Christ and he can take you from the ordinary and make you extraordinary. You see, it all depends on whose hands you're in. 